Thanks, Larry, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, just introduce very generally um, the, uh, this year's uh, report, um, policy, agriculture policy, monitoring, and evaluation. As I think all of you know, this is a report that we produce annually. Um, it covers uh, this year uh, OECD countries only. Uh, we have uh, every second year been uh, uh, reviewing policies in a range of uh, large emerging economies, essentially Brazil, uh, China, uh, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, uh, the Russian Federation, South Africa, and Ukraine. And we will uh, add to that list um, over the course of the next year or two, uh, beginning with Vietnam. Uh, this is the last year that we will produce the review of OECD countries only. Uh, in future, it will cover um, every year um, the full set of countries for which we have data. Uh, so we will not have this intermittent arrangement uh, beyond, beyond this year. Um, that's essentially all I want to say. Uh, Morvrid will answer any hard questions uh, later on, uh, and Frank is going to take uh, eight or ten minutes to introduce the report to you. So, Frank? Yes. Oh, good morning again. So Good morning. Um, I will talk to some of the main points of this report, Agriculture Policy Monitoring and Evaluation 2014. Um, well, this report, as Ken has said, we produce this annually. It offers a one-stop shop on agricultural policy developments in 2013 and a little bit a period before that, and its effects of agriculture support in uh, OECD countries. A one-stop shop that uh, will say it's uh, comprehensive, it contains everything that you ever would like to know about agricultural policies in OECD countries. Um, an important aspect of the way we do this is that it includes a comparable measurement of support, so what countries do to support their farmers, um, over a relatively long period. This effort started in the mid-1980s and is continuing until today. Comparable measurement that will say that it's consistent across countries and over time that makes it uh, possible for us to produce numbers um, that are, are comparable across countries. So you compare not apples with oranges, but apples with apples. And we update this every year um, for the OECD countries and of next year, as of next year, we will con continue to include emerging economies in it. Um, some of the highlights, well, OECD farm support inched lower a little bit in 2013, but it's still significant, a little bit lower than in the years before. So producer support expressed as a percentage of gross farm receipts. So how much of gross farm receipts stems from policies in one way or the other is now at 18% on average across the OECD, which is just slightly lower than 2012. It was, I think, 19%. However, there's a long-term trend in uh, observable, and that's in a decreasing trend. So consistently across the OECD countries, um, support has been going down over this long time period. Uh, just two decades ago, it was at 30% of gross farm receipts. So that's a, quite a big decrease. However, it's important not just to look at the size of the support, but also um, at its composition. So what is the policy instruments? And there we can say that still um, about half of the support is in forms that can be considered as production and trade distorting. And I will go into this a little bit uh, shortly. In terms of absolute numbers, we are talking about uh, 258 billion US dollars or 194 billion euros. Um, that has been uh, going into farm support across the OECD countries. Now, a very um, dense slide, perhaps, but I hope insightful for you. So this shows you the level and the composition of producer support to agriculture um, over the long run. So starting in 1986, going until 2013. So the first thing to observe on this chart is it's going down, okay? So whereas in the, in the mid-80s, uh, more than 30, 35% even, of farm receipts came from policies in some form or the other, it's now down to 18%. And this is consistently happening over, over time. The second thing to observe in this chart is that the big dark blue part, the lower part in the, in the chart, is becoming smaller 
over time. Um, and the upper parts, the light blue and to some extent also the gray, become bigger. Now, why do we find this important? Because the dark blue as well as the second one, the, the gray ones, are considered to be forms of support. They're very distorting for markets. Those are forms of support. They're directly linked to commodity output and prices. So think of a payment per ton of wheat or something like that. Um, but also price measures. So measures that directly interfere in prices and quanti quantities in, in markets. Um, the less the support is linked to prices and outputs, the less it distorts markets. And that's what you see in this lighter blue part. So that's increasing. So what are those? Those are payments that are more distant from current production. Uh, for example, payments per area, payments per hectare, or payments um, per animal. Going even a bit further, so if this support is given in a form that no production at all is required, of course, it reduces interferences with markets. So that's grosso modo a development that you can see. Some, there's a decline consistently over time and some re-instrumentation of support to forms that are less interfering with markets. Now, this is the picture across the OECD, um, the whole OECD countries but within OECD countries, there is a large variation, both in the size, but also in the composition of support to farmers. Um, so this slide shows you um, the lineup of the OECD countries that we're covering, um, where on the left-hand side, you have Norway, Japan, and Switzerland. Uh, on the right-hand side, Australia, New Zealand, and Chile. So you can see that uh, there's huge differences. So on the left-hand side, um, countries are giving more than 50%, so um, meaning that more than 50% of gross farm receipts stem from policies. Okay, On the right-hand side, countries like Chile, Australia, and New Zealand, they do very little in terms of supporting their farmers. And the rest of the countries are somewhere in between, obviously. Um, you can also see that um, the different color shadings differ dramatically between countries, so some countries use lots of this support that are described as being distorting, so the dark blue bits, and others do less of that. So the lesson that you can take here is that um, in combination with my previous slide, there are some reform efforts over the years have taken place, but they're still at different speeds and also somewhat different directions. Now, these observations, together with uh, the analysis that we're continuously doing in the House, lead to some recommendations that I would like to summarize in just uh, those um, five points on, on this slide. First of all, it would be important to reduce price and output linked policies, uh, especially in order to avoid also increasing the support that distorts markets when prices go down. <clears throat> um, eventually. Now, why am I saying this? Because much of the decline that we observe in, in recent years has to do with high prices. Lots of this support, uh, the form that it's given, is linked to high prices in the sense that it's less support is given if prices are high, more support would be given if prices come down. So delinking that link between price developments and support that's given to farmers would be important. So that leads to the recommendation to reduce those forms of support. Another useful thing to do would be to remove border policies that in the end will contribute to international price volatility by trying to insulate domestic markets. By trying to insulate domestic markets from, from international developments, the volatility on international markets is increased and that is in the end not a good thing for anybody. So while those two first recommendations are recommendations to undo policies that exist, there are better ways to do things. So what could be done? In increase, in the first place, investments in public goods that have a long-term benefits to the agricultural sector and to society as a whole. Think of innovation. Think of more efforts to increase productivity, but also sustainability of farming. Um, recent years have seen uh, much discussion of price volatility, and useful ways to address those would be risk 
management tools for farmers to cope with those risks. But those have to be, be designed in such ways that they do not interfere with the normal business risk and those risks that can be marketed, the insurance products, for example, could be, could be envisaged. Um, and finally, it would be important also to improve the coherence between agricultural policies and other policy areas, in particular trade policies, rural development policies, but also macroeconomic policies, in order to create an environment that is conducive to investment in agriculture and to attract resources, both capital but also human, into the sector. I will leave it here, my brief introduction, um, just to show you where you can find more information. Of course, we have a website um, where you can find all this and more, and also a new <coughs> software tool that you may find interesting that visualizes the data that are uh, in, in the report. So thank you, and um, back to questions? you. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. <coughs> Okay, that's very good. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, we'll now open up the floor to questions. Please um, identify your, your self name and the media you work for. Um, and secondly, don't forget to use the microphone. You just push the orange button. Who's first? Rudy Rutzenberg with Bloomberg News. Uh, two questions, if I may. Um, you didn't publish uh, the data on uh, some of the emerging uh, markets, uh, but could you give an indication of the trend in uh, 2013 in uh, countries like China and Russia? And uh, the second is that um, uh, there are quite a few agricultural organizations uh, claiming that we will need more investment in agriculture uh, going forward uh, due to some of the challenges such as climate change. Uh, how does uh, the OECD uh, advocating of reducing uh, agricultural support uh, mesh with that? Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for the question. I, 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 have, a, I have a go at it. I have a try. Well, indeed, we have not covered in this year uh, emerging markets at all. Um, so we cannot really say very much about the developments of policies over the, over the last year in those countries. But if you look um, at what happened in previous years, and there's a lot of consistency in those policies over time, as, as we know, we know that um, some emerging economies, not all of them, but some that you mentioned, in particular China and Russia, they have been increasing their support to, to farmers in recent years. And as far as we know, although we haven't covered it in great detail, but this trend has uh, continued also over the last year. So they're increasing their, their support to, uh, to farmers, um, often in ways that um, would fall into the category that is we, we could consider as being the distorting forms of support, not giving payments, budgetary payments to farmers, but um, interfering um, in markets uh, more directly. Um, there is a box in the report, if you're interested, that uh, summarizes what, we, uh, what uh, we said last year, at least. Um, now, coming to your second question, which is about um, the call by various international organizations and other um, uh, actors in that field for more investment in, in agriculture globally to increase or improve sustainability, but also productivity. Yes, we also think so that this would be very important. Um, to do that. Um, however, the question is who is doing what and how do you stimulate it? It does not necessarily, this call for more investment does not necessarily translate into more support to agriculture in the ways that we see them today. There's lots of scope to increase investments also by the private sector, um, by farmers themselves, of course, but also other actors in, in the private sector. Um, but in order to do so, the policy environment needs to be conducive, or the economic environment needs to be conducive, conducive to attract those investments and not um, uh, do the opposite, so um, scare them away, the investors. Now, there is some scope, nevertheless, for governments to do something, and we, we think it would be very important to increase um, the agricultural knowledge and innovation systems. So that's typically an area where government has a role to play uh, to, uh, to organize uh, or help better develop, uh, let's say, innovation systems uh, in OECD, but also in other countries. 
by doing what? By um, stimulating those efforts in innovation and research that take care of public goods, those things that cannot be done by the private sector. You would think more about basic research, of course, but also, in some cases, about uh, improved transmission of knowledge and innovations to the, to the farm level, so that's extension services. Um, and on top of that, much can be done also by improving international collaboration between countries uh, in terms of innovation, the agricultural innovation systems. Rudy, if I could just add a, a couple of points uh, on, 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 on both aspects. Um, I mean, Frank is absolutely right that, that we see a, a trend where support in, in OECD countries has been coming down and it's been increasing uh, in many of the emerging economies, in particular Russia and China. But beginning from where? Uh, and in OECD countries, it began, as you saw on the graph, from a very high level, so from 35, 36% of, of gross farm receipts to about 18 uh, in, in China, for example, it began negative, negative support, so agriculture was taxed, to now approaching roughly the OECD average. So we have a big increase in emerging economies, but from a very low base. And we have a big decrease in OECD countries, but from a very high base. And, and they're, they're converging. So support levels, to grossly oversimplify, are, are beginning to look very similar. Uh, and the nature of that support is looking a little more similar than we would advocate. Uh, the second point I think is really important to, 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 be, to be clear that we, we are um, quite bullish on OECD countries uh, redu reducing support that is price and output linked. And that's exactly what's in the graph and what's in the report. So we, we don't say abandon agriculture. We say abandon policies that have been in place for a long time that have been demonstrated not to be effective and replace them with public investments in things that respond to your interest in rural and remote community well-being, in adapting to climate change, into sustaining land and water resources, into improving productivity and so on. So it's a reduction of ineffective support but investment, including public investment, in things that generate returns over time. Thanks, Ken. Um, other questions here, please, right there. Sibyl de la Med from Reuters. Um, EU farm ministers are meeting tomorrow in Brussels to discuss the impact of the restrictions on uh, um, food imports um, from Russia, uh, Russia's in restrictions on food imports. Um, what do you think um, the EU and European countries sh should do to limit the impact? Thank you. Well, you won't find anything in the report on that, uh, but let me let me try and answer your your, your question. Um, I mean, embargoes and bans like we're seeing now um, are always costly, and they will impose costs uh, on importers. They will impose costs in this case on Russia itself in the form of higher prices. Uh, it will the the effect will also be to to uh, increase. Uh, uh, costs, net benefits, lowering revenues for, for exporters. And those exporters will also, um, as they try to search for alternative markets, uh, um, uh, incur costs as well. So it, it's, there's a very obvious price cost impact. Uh, now, how big is it? Um, th the truth is uh, we don't know. What we do know uh, is that about 5% of EU exports measured on the basis of last year's performance uh, are potentially affected by the ban. Uh, in the case of the U.S., it's something less than 1% uh, of U.S. Uh, agricultural exports. Um, so the impact uh, is of that magnitude um, at the outside. Now, um, that's not to say that 5% of EU exports uh, roughly 5 billion uh, euros. Um, that is not a loss. That is uh, a, an amount of export that will not go to Russia. Uh, it'll go somewhere else, or some of it will go somewhere else. Uh, 
Um, some of it uh, might be stored while market opportunities open up, but it's, it's, it's a fact uh, that in particular for more perishable products like some fruits and vegetables, uh, there will be a problem. Uh, there will be an impact. Um, it will not be enormous in terms of global mm -hmm. markets, but if it's my farm that no longer has a market that I've had for 30 years in Russia, then, then it's, it, it, it'll be real. It'll, it'll be a real impact. Um, so keeping, keeping the scope and the scale of this in, in perspective, I think, is, is, is very important. Uh, and I think what the EU has, uh, has done to date uh, is exactly the right thing. It's been a measured response. It's said uh, that uh, we uh, will look at the situation, we will provide support, we will use existing mechanisms in the common agricultural policy to help farmers that are negatively affected. Uh, that's good. It's important to send that, that signal. Uh, it's also important to avoid making mistakes uh, and, and premature uh, announcements of blanket compensation, um, reinstitution of export subsidies and refunds so we can move the problem onto global markets. Uh, those kinds of responses have been avoided and we hope they continue to be avoided. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, doing exactly what I hope they do tomorrow, talking about the problem and how big it is and where it is and, and how assistance can be provided to individuals affected and how more systemic assistance like storage, like information on markets that do exist, like trade promotion, those kinds of things. Um, those are very good things to do. So, so the EU response to date, uh, in our view, has been quite measured uh, and, and exactly the right one, and we hope it continues uh, in, in the same vein. Hervé Plagnol from AgroPress. Uh, continuing on that subject, don't you think that uh, seeing what Russia did would show that agriculture will more and more be a uh, strategic uh, issue for the big countries and that the policies, the agricultural policies, will perhaps in the future become more important because of this strategic importance? I have a second uh, question uh, on another field. Would you have some information on the evolution of the risk management, the insurances uh, organizations in countries and its part in the agricultural revenue? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try to address your first question and buy some time for my colleagues to think about your second. Um, I mean, I think you're right. The, the, the importance of the global food and agriculture uh, system uh, is important and in the future, I think, will be recognized to be even more important. So I'm not sure its importance grows, but the recognition that, that we need to maintain the capacity to feed ourselves uh, and to do so in a you know, without, without shocks that, that have uh, um, humanitarian impacts that, that none of us want, want to think about. Um, so yes, uh, it, it, it's, it's uh, a, an incredibly important strategic uh, sector. Uh, and yes, policies to ensure that the sector grows um, to its maximum potential are appropriate. That's, that's, that's easy to agree with, and I don't think any, any country I've ever worked with would, would dispute that. What, what, what's at, what's at, at a point of debate today is how do you do that? How do you, how do you maintain uh, a reliable, a safe, a, a consistent supply of food uh, around the world? And is it with policies that isolate markets, or is it with policies that encourage competitive producers, wherever they are, uh, to maximize their competitive potential, uh, policies that encourage a, a more efficient, sustainable use of, of in particular, water, but, but land as well. Um, and, and that's what we advocate very strongly, a, a, a focus on investment in um, effective use of, 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 of natural resources, uh, developing capacity uh, to, to supply food whether you're in Africa, Asia, Latin America, or, or Europe, um, but not 
carving up the world in, 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 in parts and, and trying to maintain um, um, uh, food supplies on a, on a very local uh, and, 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 and narrow level. Uh, now, obviously, uh, for that to work, uh, you need effective uh, 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 multilateral trade rules. Uh, and there's room for, for, for improvement uh, to, to be made, and hopefully we'll see some improvement over the course of the coming year or two. Uh, Frank, I don't know if, if <coughs> yes. you want to say a few words about risk management? Sure. Um, certainly I would like to do that because it's a very important area. Also, <coughs> for my recommendations that you would like to see more um, uh, effective risk management tools to be de developed. I want to say a couple of general words and then coming to your question, which countries uh, uh, we are covering. So in, in general, I think when you talk about risk management for agriculture, it's important to distinguish three types of layers of risk uh, where, and in these different layers of risk, uh, there are different roles for policies. So on the one hand, you have the normal business risk that every business is taking, not just farmers, but also your shoemaker in the corner. So there is clearly not a role for um, government intervention. On the other end of the spectrum, you have catastrophic risks. Think of uh, natural uh, disasters, climate-related, weather-related, but also war-related, perhaps. Okay? There certainly is a role for government to step in, in a certain way. And in the middle, there is a layer of risks that could potentially be marketed, for example, through insurance products. Now, where exactly the boundaries are, those are not always easy to define, but they can be defined. Um, um, now, what we see is that um, countries have been using and continue to use um, um, policy instruments in this middle layer as well as in the wide layer, so the catastrophic ones. In the middle layer, what you're talking about, for example, is subsidies to insurance premium, so crop insurance, uh, for example. A country that has made a big move in that direction in, in this last reform is the United States. So they have abolished uh, the direct payments and put more money into the um, uh, farm insurance programs. Um, Canada is another case where a lot of effort in the policy box is going into, into risk management. Um, those instruments uh, typically will need to have a large subsidy for the premium because otherwise farmers would not take them up. Now, in the current high price situation, relatively high price situation, those do not cost very much for governments. But they may be very costly once market, markets are changing. So when then these insurances need to pay out. So at this point in time, we don't know how big this effect will be uh, because markets are where they are right now. But there is, of course, uh, a budgetary implication in the future that is difficult to control. Um, so that's... A, a, Again, the country that has done a big move in that direction recently is the United States in the latest uh, farm bill. Um, the European Union as well has a lot of risk management aspects in, in the cap that are, that are being used and are being in the latest cap reforms also increased. Now coming to the catastrophic layer of risks that I mentioned, so when really something bad happens that is outside the control of of, of anybody, of the farmers or so, where we see clearly a role for governments to step in to do something. Uh, and countries that have been uh, very active in this are those where um, more or less regularly you have big climatic events, like Australia, for example, where you have droughts, and then the next year you have a flood. Um, now there, it is important to define precisely what is a catastrophe. What is the boundary? When, when does government step in and how does it step in? Why is that important? In order to uh, make sure that the demands for compensation that will always come in those situations are not just leading to dishing out uh, money in great amounts indiscriminately. So it's important to define what is a catastrophe and what is government going to do in those cases. Um, now, if you allow me to come back to what the European Union is now discussing or already doing in terms of handling the crisis that, um, that is imminent, there, the interesting aspect there is that responsibilities are shared between farmers and, and Brussels. So there is not a compensation 
uh, flat out, but there is a shared responsibilities with a partial compensation for storage, partial compensation for taking product off the market, which is, in principle, a very good approach because it disciplines a little bit the, um, the amount of compensation, if you wish, that, that could be given. So, summing up, risk is complicated. I try to make it a little bit simpler by distinguishing three groups of risk, where um, so governments do something already in those risks that are marketable, by subsidizing insurance, for example, and they do something in the catastrophic risks that could not be covered by any individual or group of individuals alone. And the latter group, important to define what is a catastrophe and what does government do. <clears throat> Other questions there? Rudy, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Rudy Rittenberg with Bloomberg. Um, the World Bank uh, in the recent past has uh, sort of uh, restated its mission a little bit, uh, this and also in relation to, uh, to agriculture, and it's paying a lot more attention to, uh, to climate change and its, uh, and its effects on our future uh, in their policies. Um, does uh, the OECD see a role for itself in this debate? And if so, what, uh, what would be uh, the strength of the OECD in this debate? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think it's really important to distinguish um, between an interest in um, defining the degree of climate change and climate change impact that there might be. There's a lot of groups that uh, model and forecast and, and worry about measures and degrees of future climate change. Um, that is not something uh, that uh, we in the agriculture group would worry too much about. We're happy to look at what uh, our environmental colleagues or what the World Bank or what the IPCC might have to say and take that for, for, for good information. We're much more concerned in looking at, so what does it mean for agricultural policy today? Uh, what we do know about climate change uh, is that uh, we will have more variability in the future. We will have uh, a different distribution of water. We could, in some extreme scenarios, see production zone, zones shift. Um, so if, uh, under those various uncertainties, uh, some range of alternative futures, uh, we would like to continue to feed ourselves, what do we need to do today? Uh, what are the policies that best position um, agriculture uh, around the world, not just in OECD countries, uh, to, to adapt to uh, these changes? And what can we do to, uh, to mitigate them? So what are the kinds of things that could be done to reduce agriculture's contribution to uh, greenhouse gas emission, for example? But I think the focus, uh, first and foremost, is on um, identifying uh, sensible policy approaches to generate more resilient, more adaptive, more responsive, um, uh, more effective agriculture systems given uh, the climate uncertainties. Um, so it's, again, this, this to, to bring it back full circle, Rudy, we, we, we think telling farmers to produce what they used to produce and we'll give you money to do it and we'll you know, eliminate any, any competition from external sources is not a good approach. Um, but, but growing your productivity, more um, uh, resilient uh, uh, production systems and so on, um, some, some additional investments in those areas uh, would, would make a great deal of sense to us. Are you happy to, to the extent to that you're seeing governments doing this? Uh, whether I'm happy or not is not, I guess, I, you know, it's not particularly significant. Um, governments can do more. Uh, governments can do much more to uh, invest uh, in improving agricultural productivity, uh, in creating incentives to uh, use uh, land, water, biodiversity resources more efficiently. Uh, and that's uh, at the heart uh, of, 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 of our report. Uh, so we would like to see, again, a shift from what was done uh, post-war uh, to what should be done to strengthen and make more resilient uh, the global food and agriculture system. 
this great book of numbers has many of the answers to your questions. Um, or at least it has the numbers. <laughs> it has the numbers, yeah. No, just in, in, terms, in terms of perspective, um, the amount, um, or the, the, let's say the proportion of support right now that is going to um, issues like um, improving, improving agricultural innovation systems um, and hence to having an effect on, on productivity in the, long, in the longer run is in budgetary terms relatively small still. Uh, it's um, um, of the total support estimate that we're having, it's below 13%. So, I don't know what you're looking at. But I'm looking at, I'm looking at page 72. <laughs> there's a big, big table. Um, and there is something, uh, there's a row there that's called GSSE, General Support Estimate. And that's typically where you find um, uh, public policies that are addressing needs of the sector as a whole. So that's not uh, support that goes to individual farmers, but that's something that serves the sector as a whole, like innovation systems. Um, um, so that's a relatively small proportion, and we believe that could well go up. And uh, by re-instrumenting more of the existing, to existing support into that direction. At the same time, if it comes to sustainability uh, issues, um, there is, in some of the OECD countries, much more conditionality on the, on the, on the support that's given uh, in, in environmental sense. So you give a support, but farmers have to use certain farming practices in order to get it or to get the full amount, for example. So these are ways also to introduce, but through the back door a little bit, um, environmental sustainability in, in the current support uh, and policies that's, that's done. But the bottom line is, you know, the GSSE, and that could go up. It's relatively small still. Uh, may I uh, go further on that question? Usually, productivity policies, open farming, open markets, has meant in the past more concentration in the farms, for the farms. And uh, that means more people going from farm business to uh, industrial business. What you say should be in uh, the future, doesn't, is it still possible when we see that the unemployment in the industrial matters, in the services, is very high? So all the people that will not do farming anymore, what will they do? Won't, uh, they should uh, become people unemployed in the other uh, activities like industries or, or services. So isn't there another situation because of the increasing unemployment in other uh, fields to deal with? I think we need to be uh, we need to be very specific when we when we address that that kind of question. Um, there has been in OECD countries uh, a movement of people out of agriculture uh, into uh, alternative uh, for them individually more remunerative activities for a very very long time. And the basic underpinning of what we would say at OECD is our aim ought to be to give individuals, households, choices mm -hmm. to do whatever they want to do. If that means stay in agriculture or that means go into something else. So one has to look at development opportunities, economic opportunities outside of agriculture as well as inside <laughs> of agriculture. So we would not advocate policies that encourage people to stay in farming if that's not what they decided to do. Now. You are more likely to stay in farming uh, if you can make a good living from being a farmer. And you will make a good liver, living from being a farmer if you have a resource base that's adequate, if you are sufficiently productive and competitive to be able to earn money, um, and so on and so on. So yes, you will see concentration over time. Uh, we would not advocate any particular model of agriculture, whether it's a small model, a medium model, or a great big industrial model. We would advocate uh, 
opportunities, choices for individuals to do what they decide to do that's best for them. Um, when you look outside of OECD countries, um, there is a, um, a, a very large reliance on agriculture, almost as a social safety net in many countries. When you have 50% of your workforce engaged in agriculture, yet only maybe 15, 20% of, of um, your, 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 your GDP coming from the sector, I mean, you, you have, a, you have a, in a sense, a social policy, a safety net, a, a people on the firm because they have nowhere else to be. And, and in that case, it's a different set of, 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 of policies and objectives to, to try and um, uh, invest more in, provide uh, training to um, enable uh, uh, relatively small firms and resource poor firms uh, to do more than produce enough food for half the year, produce enough food for the whole year, and produce enough food to sell some. Uh, but, but again, that will not happen by keeping 50% of the population in, in, in very many countries mm -hmm. in agriculture. So it's, it's, it, there's a wider development um, aspect, I think, that we cannot lose sight of. And it's, in, in fact, a bit dangerous to, to talk about agriculture alone when, when talking about employment and development opportunities. I think we have to look at the whole economy. Um, any other questions? Anyone here in the room? Um, otherwise, I'd <clears throat> encourage you to speak with our experts individually if you have individual questions. Also, for those of you watching online, feel free to contact us um, in the OECD media office, and we can put you in touch with experts if need be. Um, thank you very much.